I'm back on Saldo. So again, thank you very much for your <laughs> attention. So um, as I mentioned, I come from the Migration Health Division because then that's basically I'll talk about some of the things that we are doing because we have other people from different uh, departments who are involved in other aspects uh, of uh, migration and also specifically um, in Greece or in other receiving countries. So within the Migration Health Division, generally speaking, we work in three main areas, what we call three pillars. One is direct assistance to migrants. That includes health assessments for resettlement and relocation. As it is in Europe, we have a mental health and psychosocial unit as well. Then we have the uh, whole unit, so, or rather, department, sub-department that works in, in emergency, and then we have the general area of health promotion where basically looking at policies and project implementation and so forth. So just to remind again of our migration health framework that guides our work, it's again a recognition that migration is a determinant, an additional determinant of health, that it's important in terms of uh, when we think about how to look at the entire migration um, cycle and where we can intervene because all these factors uh, affect migrant health. We look in this, we work in these four main areas that were early mentioned that aro arose out of the IOM WHO consultation, first consultation on migration and health, with you know the monitoring, the policy and legal framework, migrant sensitive health system, and the importance of intersectorial and intercountry uh, and between country coordination. And also the second uh, IOMWHO consultation, which was held this year, identified these additional areas in terms of look at what's happening at global health in linking migration and uh, development. So I mentioned a little bit earlier in the morning what we're doing in terms of policies uh, work, um, the MIPEX health and some of the indicators and recommendations. In terms of global health, you're probably aware um, of the work around the global compacts. Um, so there are two global compacts that uh, are being developed right now, one on migration, one on refugees. That were, it was a decision made at the UN assembly in 2016 and unfortunately um, amongst the many elements that are supposed to be in this global compact which is uh, basically it will be the first um, intergovernmental agreement around issues on migration uh, health was not really specifically identified so this is uh, the this whole last uh, year of 2017 is the year of consultations around the global compact and next year it's going to be negotiation with member states because it's a member state led process so during this year basically IOM with WHO with HCR and other organizations have been advocating to make sure that health is included in the global compacts including you know access to health care and et cetera, et cetera. So actually uh, by now uh, in September, uh, there was uh, the, um, the document, um, the proposal for the health inclusion. It has, it's already ready and if you're interested, I can circulate. Anyways, to be quick, uh, this time I will just uh, look at two um, initiatives uh, around monitoring of migrant health that uh, we are involved in. One is the, one of the longest standing program that IOM has. This is dates from the 50s, which is uh, the health assessment that the organization, um, our department has been doing for resettlement of refugees, for regular migrants, as well as now in the last year and a half for relocation within the EU. So this is the primary focus uh, to, to of the health assessment. I'll just quickly uh, go through it. And uh, basically, this is uh, the uh, country, the continents where we are involved. And as you can see, uh, for the last 16 years, IOM has pe performed over 3 million of health assessments. And um, you, you can see uh, where the countries are and the numbers. So why do we do our health assessment? Is to address some public health issues related to mobility, to facilitate integration of refugees, so the information uh, when they come with, sig with significant medical condition into the health system of uh, receiving countries. Also to promote the health of refugees, for example, we, if, if a condition, if, for example, if TB is detected within a refugee, they are treated before, you know, they are resettled to, um, and the resettlement countries, as you saw, it's mostly the traditional countries of resettlement. 
um, U.S., Canada, well, I mean, used to be, uh, Canada, uh, New Zealand, Australia, and so forth, and uh, to uh, address the biases and dispel the myths around migrant health. So basically, we do have the data to which um, I'm not going to show data because there was a lot that was shown showing that basically infectious disease is not an issue. And of course, uh, why do we do it? It is to inform policy and planning. So now coming back to the EU, um, what we have been doing, uh, at least for my office uh, here, is um, in the last eight years, and I stress this, we have been doing investigations around situational analysis around health during the reception process. And I stress that the last uh, eight years, because lots of the issues that we found and in all of these areas, the huge gaps existed much before the so-called crisis. So often now we think when we discuss these issues about the reception process that maybe it is due because there is mass of mass um, arrivals, because of, you know, all of a sudden, sudden arrivals, lack of preparedness. We just want to stress that all these there are fundamental structural issues within the reception process existed when the numbers were trickling down or rather a very manageable, and in countries which were, you know, quite used to not only new arrival countries. And when, of course, the numbers became huge, the issues can only, you know, increase because there are some fundamental uh, issues that need to be dealt with. So just a summary, basically, and that has been reiterated uh, today in, uh, in, in with many experiences, that overall there are chronic deficiencies within the reception process, a lot related to insufficient lack of uh, staff, you know, basically lack of health staff or any type of staff, psychologists, uh, mediators, and uh, in terms of numbers, in terms of skills, there is a uh, non-compliance with the council directive of minimum standards, which I mentioned this morning. So basically, even though it is a legal instrument um, that the member states have signed, and overall, there is this tendency to uh, look at migration as something, you know, okay, if there is a mass arrival or as uh, an emergency, rather than look at something that is going to continue to happen and that needs to be addressed in a systematic um, way. So just, uh, you know, a few of the findings, I will not go too much into it, but basically, and that was raised this morning, there is a significant uh, support that needs, is needed for the staff, both in terms of training, but also in terms of their own uh, health. When we started to uh, develop some training materials and implement it in, uh, uh, so five, six countries, uh, quite a lot in Greece uh, in, in collaboration with partners, with MSF, with the National School of Public Health. Basically, within the first few sessions, there was this need to develop additional models on dealing with grief because in first, uh, for, for first respondents. Now, going back to the uh, monitoring of uh, migrant health and the coordination, uh, basically, and the situation, this is from 2014, the situation hasn't uh, changed uh, very much. I mean, I give Italy as an example, but it's the same in most of the countries. There is a multitude of actors who are at play during the reception process, from the moment of arrival to transfer in reception centers, in detention centers. So there is constant need of coordination. And yes, there have been some initiatives, like the one that HCR mentioned, in terms of coordination at national level. But different actors are involved in different settings. So in one island, it could be five, six different, uh, you know, either ministries or, or, um, or NGOs or international organizations. In another one that can be another one. So that's at country level, not to mention at European level. So of course there are gaps in data collection, in health assessment. If there is something systematic that is being done, usually it's only about infectious disease. So for example, in Spain, in Melilla and Ceuta, they use what they call the Af African uh, profile screening on infectious disease that they do systematically. But overall, you know, each actor that's involved in the field use different type of assessment. So we also repeated this, or, or rather there was within another uh, aspect, um, ECDC in 2016 asked us to do again, or rather to look at specifically what's happening with infectious disease, which still is the one that, you know, is more, there is more interest in rather than, you know, non-communicable disease. So basically we had similar findings and recommendations, which are somewhere here. 
um, basically finding that um, you know there are huge gaps and there is a need of both at an in-country level as well as between countries of systematizing unifying health assessment. So these are over the last years many you know national stakeholders meeting local at different places as well as regional consultations. So basically these are some of some of the recommendations that the Ministry of Health needs to take leadership because in many of the countries within the reception process, it is the Ministry of Interior who subcontracts other entities, so it becomes quite complicated. And that there is a need to unify health assessment, that health assessments are done, you know, to uh, provide health care, and there is a need for sharing um, um, data. So at 2015, uh, at the end of 2015, uh, even though, like I said, we've been advocating for this for the last um, 10 years, um, the Commission asked us to develop a handbook on uh, health assessment uh, on, uh, for health professionals to provide guidance. So this was based on previous work as well as the extensive experience the organization has with uh, resettlement and health assessments, as I mentioned, and to develop a personal health record, which is called different names now, but uh, basically that's the PHR which was developed, uh, as I mentioned here, the idea was to try to have a unified instrument for the voluntary assessment of the health status and the provision of this record to the migrants uh, to ensure continuity of care, care provision as well as, you know, have the data and support cross-border cooperation. Um, which, you know, so this was done. I have some samples if you want, but basically this is available in um, the handbook in nine languages plus in Arabic and the personal health record right now is uh, English Arabic. So subsequently within a direct agreement with the commission, we developed an uh, electronic platform of this uh, personal health record. Um, there was a lot of consultation. Some of it was virtual. That is, you know, we provided access to the platform and there are already by now several iteration of the tool that was um, that has been done, including uh, you know having the consent forms in many languages, reorganizing sections, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There was piloting that was done also in the field, so in these four countries that you see, in Italy, in, in uh, two settings, uh, in which uh, in Syracuse and nine uh, different uh, nine um, centers. So basically, what is the uh, electronic personal health record? I mean, it's quite simple. It's um, software. It allows, um, you know, a progressive updating of the status. So even if, let's say, somebody arrives in theory, we say, because, you know, we haven't spread that much yet, at an island and has the two, three minutes first assessments, you know, the major conditions will be recorded. But then when the person is transferred to another place or to another country, then, uh, you know, you'll be able to update um, the, um, the situation and also to give the record uh, to the migrants. So just, to, uh, you know, some of the standard screen that you can, uh, you know, imagine into a database uh, with uh, it is uh, I, IHR um, and IC ICD compliant and basically uses um, all of this. So it, it's we're trying to make it as easy uh, to, to fill by having most of the, you know, just fields drop down menu. We have vaccinations, of course, and uh, a summary section uh, as well. The case, yeah, then you can update uh, the number, uh, the case number, and have, of course, aggregated um, uh, data. So currently, we have uh, two. It's a web link, so basically, access can be done from anywhere, and you're quite welcome, you know, to to uh, get into it within the demo. Of course, no data um, a demonstration to play with it and see what it looks like. Now, of course, uh, this, this is just a tool. I mean, the, the purpose of the tool is to promote appropriate healthcare provision, basically, uh, and also to uh, foster a model of healthcare that includes health mediation, because we wouldn't be able to actually implement uh, tool any any tool or even to provide any type of quality care without interpretation, without mediation. So this is something that uh, we actively promote within, uh, and that's how we are able to to um, to, to 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 work on it. 
And this is uh, why basically in open centers we have 100% uh, acceptance for migrants because that was the first question that, uh, you know, the first concern that people had that, you know, migrants would not want to, to, uh, to uh, have uh, their data collected or even to have a health assessment. We have, you know, um, overall acceptance rate. And we also did a feasibility, actually a feasibility study was done by an external agency over there, Ushi, um, the Center for <laughs> Health and Migration. And even though this was done in the early stages, so two, three months of implementation, still there is, uh, you know, from the, from the users, there is a um, um, perception that there is a high payoff with a high effort because it's a new and also because there is not enough uh, health staff. So uh, I will not go too much in the data, but this, of course, you can see what type of data we can have for vaccinations, um, conditions, and uh, also uh, summary uh, statistics, uh, disaggregated, uh, and again, um, you know, reflecting, echoing what was discussed this morning in terms of the amount of uh, the prevalence, or what should I say, the high percentages of uh, experience persons experiencing a uh, reporting experience uh, of violence, which is the bright green here. So the, this, the tool was piloted uh, from October last year until May, and now we're continuing with another direct grant agreement um, uh, from the Commission, which is co-funded, I must say, at 60% only, um, for the implementation, the continuing uh, of the use of the tool, and uh, as a basically now recognized as a tool for integration of refugees, because basically uh, you can you know identify health needs and for the continuity of care. So we started this uh, in September now, and we're de developing a revised version of the electronic um, of, uh, platform. Basically, some of the revisions have to do with working offline, because of course we realize in some settings you may not have internet and a few other um, languages, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, so the idea is to consolidate the use of the tool in the settings where we started, as well as expand into other countries. We'll be able to provide uh, health status reports, some, some data, even as you know was mentioned, you don't need data to actually do the right thing, but still. Um, and to continue to foster the model of health provision with uh, mediation. So these are the current uh, sites that were um, identified for the continuation. So uh, as new country, we have Cyprus and Serbia. Um, and uh, Romania as well, we're trying out now. So basically this is, uh, you know, this, this comes within a frame, a legal framework as well that uh, is uh, within the um, EU. Um, legislation and it also is an example in a way a model of because within the EU digital agenda there is a discussion that has been decided already that there'll be work towards a personal health record for citizens so but it's still you know it's kind of a model of for at least lessons learned that we can have from this as well. So thank you very much uh, for your attention and uh, for your uh, resi <laughs> resilience until so late today. If there are questions, I'm here today and tomorrow and Monday. <laughs> yes. Yeah, no. Go ahead. Which is the ID you use for the tool for trace? Which is the what? Which is the ID of the P person? you use when you enter the date the Okay, so basically because this is meant for the reception process, so it is people we use, we use, we, li we can link with the ID that is provided when, when um, by the Minister of Interior when people arrive, but it is, it is, uh, you know, otherwise we have, we use the ID that's provided by the migrants. So it is, linked in a sense for identity, but uh, it is not data that's shared, of course, with uh, anybody but the health sector. No, so we definitely not. how when the person yeah. go in another place, how they can manage to clearly identify. Well, if, of course, you know, I mean, that's, that's it's like any uh, health record. If the person does not want, wish to be linked or wish to have their data, you know, then provided, they can 
use another ID. So this you cannot escape, for, you know, bear going into biometrics. There is a possibility to have a picture, again, depending on the consent of the person. Um, and the first thing uh, when you start the system is a double consent, one to have the health assessment and two to have the information uh, transferred. And But again, uh, this cannot be done if there is no health mediators. So usually, you know, the acceptance rate, as I mentioned, is quite high because there are people who can explain what is the purpose. And generally speaking, when it comes to health, people are quite interested and see the value of having, you know, the records. Be it, because also uh, the fields that we, call the, uh, the we, we have put very few compulsory fields, variables, at this stage, because, you know, first of all, there are so many limitations in terms of availability of staff, et cetera, et cetera. So you can use it only for vaccinations, if that's what you choose, or, you know, at this moment, it's quite open. Maybe, you know, in 10, 20 years, if it becomes indeed, a, <laughs> you know, the EU tool, we can think of, you know, uh, having some compulsory fields but right now uh, it's quite open in that sense. Thanks a lot. <laughs>